so I'm honored to be here. And I'm always happy to, to be part of anything associated with uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, whose uh, role in the story I tell in American Veda is uh, extraordinary and unsurpassed. As, as you've heard several times uh, in the last couple of days, you are a part of a lineage, a yogic lineage that has played a role in this transmission of these vast uh, and uh, multifaceted teachings that have come from India. That lineage, your lineage, is part of a larger lineage. You could say the Kriya Yoga lineage, and that's part of a larger lineage. Taken together, I like to think of all the different uh, streams and tributaries from all the branches of the Vedic tree that have evolved over the course of centuries, many, many centuries, and ended up coming to America through books and gurus and yoga masters and on and on, as we'll see in a minute. I think of that as a maha lineage. And that maha lineage that we're all part of, that you're part of, that your teachers are part of, has had an incredibly transformative impact on not only millions of lives like yours and mine, but on the culture in general. That's, that's basically the story I try to tell in American Veda. Um, because it's, you can see changes in how America understands the nature of reality and the nature of who we are and the nature of what religion and spirit, what religion can be, what spirituality means, how we practice it, how we engage in it. It has, as you just heard, affected health care. It has affected psychology. It has affected academia. It has affected all kinds of areas of life, often in ways that people uh, don't even realize have anything to do with India or the Vedic tradition because it filters into our culture in a variety of ways. So I meet people and they say, oh, well, they, they got on a spiritual path because of their psychotherapist. And they may not know that their psychotherapist lived in an ashram in the 70s, <laughs> right? And changed the language. So the language is not Vedic and there's no Sanskrit, but it's the same message coming through in the language of psychology. Your doctor may tell you to meditate for stress. Where did that come from? Trust me, in 1968, when I learned to meditate, no doctors were telling you <laughs> to meditate for your health. That came a little later. So this lineage has transformed the culture in, in, in many, many ways. And I, I think it's not unfair to say that we are becoming a nation of yogis. And I don't say that because 15 million people take yoga classes. I, I mean, there are yogis who never set foot in a yoga studio, but they're yogis in spirit, they're yogis in how they approach their spirituality, in how they see the world, and how they understand who they are, and how they understand the pluralism of approaches to spirituality, and how they understand uh, the, the nature of oneness, the, the, the Vedic principle that truth is one and the wise call it by many names is part of the fabric of American life now. You see it in, reflected in surveys of people's attitudes toward religion. The notion that spirituality is basically an inside game and it's less important what 
belief system you sign on to or what tribe you belong to, but that the essence of spirituality is your inner relationship with the divine, however you define it. That is a yogic principle, and it's reflected in surveys of American life. There's a lot of proof to what I'm saying, but I, I, pro I get the sense that I don't have to convince any of you. But um, this is my, my main evidence. Namaste. And you write this down, because this is something we're going to be using every Sunday from now on. In men, I need you to get it. Ladies, I want you to get it, but especially I want my men and boys to get it. N-A-M-A-S-T-E. That's a Hindu term. Namaste. Say that. <clears throat> Say it again. Namaste. Namaste. Jerome means the divinity within me salutes the divinity within you. Y'all missed it. Namaste means the divinity within me salutes the divinity within you. Now flag, this simply means I recognize that Bobby has some God in him. See, many of our boys don't have any respect for life. That's why it's so easy to kill them. So when I, when I realize that Bobby got some God in him, just as I have some God in me, that will make me respect him not only physically, but I'll respect what I say about Bobby. We have not been taught to respect one another, so I need you to say it again, namaste. Say it again, namaste. The divinity within me salutes the divinity. Any teaching going on here today? And maybe that's why we have been mistreating one another for much too long. I want us to start today to say that word over and over. I want men and women, young and old, to start greeting one another instead of saying, what's happening? Young folk, when you greet somebody, namaste. namaste. Say it, say it, why? Namaste. Say it again. Namaste. What does that mean? The divinity the, the within me salute. So don't come up, what's happening, bro? <laughs> Because that ain't kept our boys from killing one another. They've been saying it for a long time. What's happening, bruh? Bam! <laughs> Someday I have to write him and, and tell him the responses I get from this video. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be, wouldn't, I was just thinking how uh, it would be so wonderful if Yogananda could see that. <laughs> now obviously, I didn't just show that for entertainment purposes. And obviously, he wasn't just giving them a, a vocabulary lesson, right? I mean, this is, this is a theological teaching he was given. This is a different conception of God and, and the nature of the divine and the nature of the self, then church people in America are used to hearing. That's why we react the way we do. But the story goes back, obviously, a long way. And I'm going to give us an overview of this history of this transmission. It begins in the early 19th century. In the, I, in America, it begins in the early 19th century with the uh, transcendentalist movement. How many have read Emerson? How many have read Thoreau? Yes, OK. So I don't know if you, when you read them, they're probably ensigned in school, um, whether you noticed anything familiar but in their writing that resonated with what you understand about Eastern philosophy and yogic ideals. But Emerson, with whom it begins, was deeply impacted by the early uh, good translations and uh, texts and books like The Life of the Buddha, early translation of the Gita, that were coming in uh, 
along with journal articles into New England from the UK via the uh, scholars who were part of the British Raj living in India who began to see that the heathen that they uh, were sent there to tame and uh, convert actually may have something to teach the rest of us. And um, Emerson was deeply impacted by those teachings along with other influences on his life and what we think of as Emersonian philosophy, which has had such a huge impact on America, has a strong influence of Vedanta and yogic ideas. He's been called America's Plato. I like to think of him as America's Shankaracharya because he was really the first non-dualist philosopher in, in American life. And he, of course, uh, passed some of his thoughts and books to um, Thoreau, who had a copy of the Bhagavad Gita with him at Walden Pond, which he mentions in Walden. And you may or may not remember reading that. He calls himself a yogi in Walden, probably the first prominent American to claim that, that title. And I, I have to tell you, when I interviewed people for my book, uh, and there were over 300 of them, uh, a significant number, especially baby boomers, would say that um, they were reading Walden. They identified with Thoreau as young people. And they, he, read, he mentioned something called a Bhagavad Gita. So they went out and got one. And that started them on their spiritual path. And I have to say, it wasn't that easy to find a Gita in the, in the late 60s. Now it's very different, obviously. Then uh, moving on from, the, from those, the transcendentalists who, I should add, to this day are having an impact, especially on people who are assigned uh, reading, uh, or assigned to, to their books to read in schools. But if you, if you are so moved, I suggest going back and reading some of Emerson's essays and look to see that influence. Um, in the late 19th century, some of the, uh, you've heard New Thought referenced already today and yesterday. Uh, the progenitors of the New Thought movement who were also in New England at that time, most of them were strongly influenced by Emerson so they were getting some Vedic knowledge secondhand, but they were also reading uh, themselves texts, uh, Indian spiritual literature, Hindu and Buddhist texts. By the late 19th century, there were many more sources. And so Madame Blavatsky, who started Theosophy, and Mary Baker Eddy, who started Christian Science, were influenced by these teachings. In fact, the early editions of Mary Baker Eddy's famous, uh, essentially, Bible of Christian science had references to the Gita. They were later taken out, I was told. And then later, the uh, founders of the two most prominent today New Thought churches, whom you heard referenced already, uh, Religious Science and Unity, were very strongly influenced by, um, in their cases, not just the books, but in, they were uh, recent enough in history to have actually uh, seen uh, yogis speak. The uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, who um, founded Unity, were strongly influenced by it. I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks at Unity Village in, in uh, Missouri, where they have their annual uh, conference. And I've spoken at Unity churches, and I often read something I, I, I have in American Veda, which is an early edition of their magazine, where Charles Fillmore writes about his, how much he's uh, taking from Indian philosophy. Uh, and they're always shocked. Because, I mean, you can go to a unity church on a Sunday morning or a religious science center on Sunday morning 
and you will feel very much at home with the teachings. But you may never hear a word of Sanskrit. You may never hear any reference to Veda or Vedanta or anything. But it's there. It's there in their founding principles. It's there today in their teachings. And especially now, because so many of the ministers in the Unity Church and the, the and religious science, like Michael Beckwith in LA, whom I profile in the book, and others, were in their youth directly influenced by the gurus of the 70s before they became ministers. So it's a powerful influence, and their influence on the, on the culture has been profound. The Fillmores were at the um, World's Parliament of Religions that you heard Roy mention this morning in context of uh, Vivekananda's presence. So we're now going to leap to that moment how many know about Vivekananda in 1893? Okay, so I don't have to go into it too much. I call Vivekananda, whose 150th uh, birthday is being celebrated all year, so you'll probably hear more a lot about him this year. Um, I call him the Jackie Robinson of, the, of, of American Veda, because he was the first. He was the first to sort of break through ignorance and misconception and prejudices that uh, people had about India and Hinduism and so forth. You have to understand, this is 1893. It was a very different world. Most Americans had never met a Jew. Many Americans had never met a Catholic. This wave of immigration was just beginning. It was an overwhelmingly Protestant country. And it, you know, interfaith meant a Methodist and a, and a Presbyterian and, and a Baptist, and 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 the, uh, the 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 secret agenda of some of the organizers of that world's Parliament of Religions was to invite many representatives from other uh, other um, religions, and then of course it would be obvious by the end of the uh, Parliament that. The Protestant uh, uh, view of the world is the uh, premier culmination of religious history. This was explicit in some of their their references. Not all of them. Some some had the right intention. Um, they were not prepared for uh, Vivekananda stealing the show, and he did steal the show. I don't think we'd even remember the world's pardon of religions if it weren't for him. Um, you know, here was this dark-skinned heathen from a primitive culture, and he suddenly turned out to be erudite and brilliant, and he was giving this message that people wanted to hear. There, you could see in his history, just in that few years he was here, um, the earliest indications of how the transmission from the East was going to pan out. You had, and you see two types of Americans that are still very much with us. You had these open-minded, curious people who heard something interesting and wanted to hear more, heard something reasonable and rational that sounded that it might have practical value, and they went for it, they wanted to hear more, and hence he became the superstar, and the press was uh, wildly uh, adoring. Then you had the backlash from people who were threatened by this message, for whom uh, the Christian uh, supremacy, uh, this, the, the triumphal nature of Christianity was, uh, had to be defended, and they you know, went on the attack. And so now you have people attacking yoga and other people embracing it. So it, it. Some things never change. But he had a big impact for a variety of reasons that I, we don't have time to go into. But um, one of the things he did was uh, establish the first teaching institutions for the propagation of Vedanta in America. And he was 
very wise in what he chose to emphasize about the tradition and what he thought Americans were not ready to digest and de-emphasized certain things, left certain things out, wrote excellent books about the, he was the first, I think, to, to outline the, the Hatha Yoga, uh, not Hatha, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raj Yoga, and Gyan Yoga as four separate paths of yoga, and those books are still being, being read today. And the Vedanta societies were essentially the only game in town if anybody was drawn to the East for a few decades into the early part of the 20th century and the Ramakrishna mission that uh, he and his colleagues established in Calcutta would train swamis to come to uh, the West and they would run the centers. And that is still the case to this day. And they became the sort of home for Americans interested in exploring Indian philosophy. And then a, a great example of what I said earlier about how these teachings get promulgated. Because Americans, Westerners, would learn from gurus and books, absorb the teachings, add it to their other sources of knowledge, their own insights, adapt it to their own fields of expertise, and then in the turn become transmitters of these teachings. So you had, for example, in Los Angeles in the 1940s, well, I can't use the pointer, it's too far away, but um, you had Swami Prabhavananda running the Hollywood Vedanta Society. Uh, and uh, among the people who were hanging out with him and learning from him were Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. How many know uh, who Huxley and Isherwood were? Okay. Now, they were already famous people when they came to America and found their way to the Vedanta Center. Huxley had written Brave New World. Isherwood had written uh, the, the stories collectively known as the Berlin stories that became Cabaret, the, the play and, and musical. So they were well-known people and they attracted other well-known intellectuals and it became this hotbed of East meeting West. They started the Vedanta Press, they started a, a, a magazine, they started having uh, these uh, 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 conferences and gatherings to explore Vedanta. And the rest of Huxley and Isherwood's careers, you could see Vedic teachings influencing their work. So Huxley goes on to write classic book, The Perennial Philosophy. Do how many know that? It's, it had a tremendously important impact on, on the culture. And Isherwood goes on to write a, 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 biogra a biography of Ramakrishna and his own memoirs. And he writes with Prabhavananda translations and commentaries on the Gita and on the Yoga Sutras and some Shankara's works that were probably the most read of those books in the 60s and, and 50s and 60s and 70s. And because of Isherwood's literary uh, reputation, they sold a lot of copies. In uh, St. Louis at the same time, at the suggestion of Huxley, uh, a young scholar named Houston Smith was starting to teach uh, early in his uh, academic career, and he sought out S Swami Satprakashananda, who ran the Vedanta Society there, and everything changed for him. How many know Houston's work? Okay, well, you, you probably know him as the author of the foreword to my book. So it might surprise you to know that even before that, <laughs> he was a very well-known uh, figure. And uh, he, he, he probably was, and Chris, you can contradict me if you wish, but I, he was probably the most important scholar of religion, certainly in our lifetime, in the modern era. And yes, and his classic textbook has sold in the millions and is still being uh, used. And any, any student who takes comparative religion uh, 
I was lucky enough to get Houston's text instead of another one. They may have had their lives changed because of it. But if you read his textbook, you will see the influence of Vedanta right at the beginning and permeating his discussion of all the um, teachings. And he'll own that. I mean, he, he knows that. He's told me the impact that that had on his subsequent work, which covers, you know, decades. He's still working. In New York, at the same time, another famous public intellectual, Joseph Campbell. How many know Campbell? Right. Campbell, probably the most famous public intellectual of the late 20th century, was uh, then unknown and uh, hanging out at the New York Vedanta Center, working with uh, Swami Nikilananda, who was a great scholar. And they worked together on some early projects, and it had a transformative impact on the rest of Joseph Campbell's work. Often you don't see it. But if you look, for example, at the famous series of lecture of uh, interviews that Bill Moyers, who's you could see his shoulder there, um, did on PBS with Bill, with Campbell, he also did the series with with Houston Smith. You see that influence of the Upanishadic knowledge and yogic teachings permeating everything Campbell writes about when he when his collective works were published. They, uh, it went on the uh, heading of Thou Art That, because that was his kind of touchstone. So you could see through these examples how these core ideas get absorbed by people, translated into their own uh, knowledge and their own uh, uh, expertise, and then transmitted to others. Now, in some cases, the transmission just reaches a handful of people. In their case, it reaches millions of people. And that's, that's how this takes off. And another medium through which this occurs is the arts. So in New York, at the same time Campbell was hanging out at the Vedanta Center, just uh, J.D. Salinger was hanging out at the same center with the same Guru Swami Nikilananda. How many have read Salinger? Keep your hand up if you read anything other than Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> see, it's after Catcher in the Rye that you start to see explicitly the influence of his spiritual seeking and his studies. So in Franny and Zui, for example, you see the lives of these young New Yorkers in the 1950s, struggling with deep and profound spiritual questions and spiritual issues, and what comes to them and uplifts them and moves them along are core teachings of the mystical traditions of, from Vedanta and Buddhism, and because he studied Zen as well, and the Christian mystics and so forth. And uh, it, much can be said about, about Salinger and much has been said about Salinger. But I would encourage you to read the, the Franny and Zui and the later work, and you'll see what I mean. I'm going to read a section. How many have read his nine short story co collection? The last of those, those stories, Teddy. I remember reading this as a very young man and saying, I'm not the only crazy one who's... You know. This was published in 1952 in the New Yorker magazine and then collected as part of his collected uh, short stories that are still being read by millions of people. So Teddy is a 10-year-old boy, very precocious. And he meets a guy on a cruise ship and the guy asks some questions. And um, it comes out that Teddy remembers his past lives. Now, mind you, this is 1952 in The New Yorker. And, and the guy says, so uh, I gather you've acquired certain information through meditation that's given you the conviction that in your last incarnation you were a holy man in India but more or less fell from grace. 
And Teddy says, I wasn't a holy man. I was just a person making very nice spiritual advancement. Then I met a lady. And I sort of stopped meditating. And he says, I would have had to take another body and come back to earth again anyway. I mean, I wasn't so spiritually advanced. And, and so forth. But I wouldn't have had to come back, I wouldn't have had to get incarnated in an American body if I hadn't met that lady. I mean, it's very hard to meditate and live a spiritual life in America. People think you're a freak if you try to. Okay. So if 20 years later or 15 years later you were reading this, you say, yeah, that's why people treat me, but somebody gets it. And then there's this great moment where he talks about his first uh, mystical experience. And he says, I was six when I saw that everything was God and my hair stood up. It was on a Sunday. My sister was only a very tiny child then and she was drinking her milk. And all of a sudden I saw that she was God and the milk was God. I mean, all she was doing was pouring God into God, if you know what I mean. So that's an example of how these things get into fiction and into the minds of some people. Now, if you read literary people and people reviewing these things at the time, Salinger's just, just writing brilliant prose about eccentric wackos. But if you had a spiritual inclination and read this, you identified with it, and you identified with the teaching, and it had a transformative impact. Now here's a little known fact about a Salinger that I uncovered in my research. And you could hear it in this story, because I met a lady and I stopped meditating. He was hell-bent on enlightenment. He had a lot of, he had seen combat in World War II, and he just wanted spiritual advancement. And he'd read Ramakrishna and all, Vivekananda and all this, and he just wanted enlightenment. And he had the impression, maybe from hanging around with swamis, that you had to be a renunciate to get enlightened in this life. And this created a problem because he liked girls. So he, but he wanted enlightenment, and he was determined. And then he read a book. And guess which book it was? Yes. And in that book, he discovered that you can be a householder and get enlightened. Because there's an example of it in the book. Right? It's part of this lineage. There's Lahiri Mahasya, and he was a householder guru. This had a big impact on Salinger. And he ended up getting married and having children and becoming a, a at least getting the lessons. I don't know if he ever became a Kriyavan. And according to his daughter's memoir, he gave his kids pictures of Lahiri Mahasya to carry around with them because without him, they would never have been born. So now here we are. Um, as I said, I interviewed over 300 people for, this, for American Veda. And I would ask them how they first got interested in uh, spiritual teachings from India. And there were a lot of different kinds of stories. But some of the stories were, well, someone gave me a book. And if they said it was a book, 90% of the time it was this book. Uh, well, 80% you know what the second most often mentioned was? Hmm? Who? No. Ram Dass is Be Here Now. Cert from certain people. Ex-hippies. But, but I interviewed Ram Dass and he mentioned the autobiography of Yogi. So. The, the impact of this book is absolutely extraordinary. I don't have to tell you the kind of impact it has on people, but the scope of it may not be obvious to you. But it's been going on now for 
60 years, and it's still going on. I meet young people who read this and are transformed by it and set on a path because of it. But of course, Yogananda's influence was felt for 30 years, or almost 30 years before the publication of the book. He was, the LA Times uh, called him, the first superstar guru of the 20th century. And he, he was that. I, 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 you know his story. I don't have to go into too many details. But the fact that he chose to make America his home and his headquarters and spent 32 years in America, in L.A., the Benares of, of the West, as he called it. How many have been, by the way, to, to Southern California and seen the places, right? So you know better than anybody why I say he had the best real estate karma of all the gurus who came in. It's amazing. But think of it, he came in 1920. It was very bizarre for people to meet someone like Vivekananda in the 1890s. It was only a little less bizarre to meet or to hear about a, a yogi in America in the 20s. So imagine you're walking down a street in New York City and you see this. Silent movie. I always expect Charlie Chaplin to walk across the street. <laughs> so the, his impact has been extraordinary. It's obviously still felt. Um, I, I don't have to go into detail because uh, you know the history and I want to move on. But I'm going to read the, uh, uh, just a section from my own book at the end of the chapter on, on Yogananda. He arrived three years after the First World War and taught through the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, the dawn of the Cold, Year, a Cold War, McCarthyism, and the Korean conflict. When his boat docked in Boston, America was a nation of trains, farmers, and newspapers. By the time he passed away, <clears throat> during Dwight D. Eisenhower's 1952 presidential campaign, it had become a nation of cars, consumers, and TV viewers. It had also become, in large part due to him, a culture ripe for a Vedic tidal wave. So that kind of sums up his um, three decades here. And, uh, and we were, in fact, ready for a Vedic tidal wave, but now it's the 50s things are heating up in America. Uh, but first I want to just mention a couple of very, very important holy men from India. There were five or six that I uncovered in my research and I realized these are giants who never came to America but have had a big impact on America nevertheless because of people they influence. And as a Turns out the two I want to mention are both people who are mentioned in the autobiography of Yogi. One was Ramana Maharshi. Uh, you know that Yogananda visited him. There's a film, by the way, there's film footage of, of a documentary of Ramana, and if you go on YouTube and see it, you'll see Yogananda in one of the uh, passages in the film, because the cameras were there when he visited. You all know Ramana? Ra it's fascinating because no one knew Ramana Maharshi in, in, 
at the time he was alive. In, in the West, really, very few people did. He died in 1950. He died two years before Yogananda did. And unless you read one of the books by a Brit named Paul Brunton, or happened to read Life magazine uh, in an issue in 1949 where they profiled him, um, you didn't know much about him. But some people did, and later people did, and people met people who were disciples of Ramana, and they had an impact. And so it went until now with the possible exception of Yogananda's, that face is probably the best known holy man face in, in the West. People have it on their altars. People have it in their yoga studios. He's come to symbolize, especially Advaita Vedanta. And there are Westerners now teaching, claiming to be teaching in this tradition. And if you go to the Ramana Maharshi Ashram in Tiruvannamala in South India, you can't even make a reservation. You have to do it months in advance because so many Westerners have come to that town as a pilgrimage to, to Ramana. It's extraordinary. The other teacher who had a big influence, who also died in 1950, was Sri Aurobindo, who was mentioned in a couple of footnotes in the autobiography. How many know Aurobindo? How many have read Aurobindo? How many started reading Aurobindo and couldn't get very far? <laughs> <laughs> Very dense, but brilliant. And he's had a tremendous influence that people don't know about, really, except uh, in certain circles. But I want to trace some of that influence because it extends out. How many know of Esalen down the road in Big Sur? Okay. How many have been to Esalen? How many have been wanting to go for the last... Okay. How many haven't gone because they think you have to take your clothes off? <laughs> so you don't have to. That's the secret. Esalen was started in 1962 by, uh, by these guys. And Michael Murphy, who is still alive and is in his 80s, um, studied it at Stanford as a young man in the, in the uh, early 50s. And he had a professor who, like Houston Smith, was one of the few religious scholars of that era who understood Eastern teachings and held them in high esteem and uh, taught them uh, with uh, vigor. And his name was uh, Frederick Spiegelberg. And Murphy became a student of his and switched majors from pre-med. And um, after graduating, uh, or a couple of years later, went and spent over a year at the Aurobindo ashram in India. Aurobindo was long gone. But he came back, and as he put it when I interviewed him, uh, and as he's told others, he was fired up by the vision of creating an institute that would combine the best of the East and the best of the West in exploring the higher reaches of human potential. And it was a largely Aurobindo-inspired vision. And that's what Esalen was, and in fact still is. All of the public image, uh, you know, is of sort of hippie excess and hot tubs and everything. Which is not untrue, but, but it, it was also a, a um, cauldron of this east-west ferment. I mean, some of the people who, the first people who were giving seminars there were people like Huxley and Joseph Campbell and Houston Smith and Alan Watts. This, it, it was, you know, and, and since then, it's been this East meets West meeting ground. In fact, I'm, I, put it on your calendars, July 4th weekend, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a weekend there. We're going to great depths about this, and I'm going to, doing with uh, Sherry Baptiste, the famous yoga teacher from the Bay Area. We're going to work together. And so this continues. And there's always been think tanks and a serious intellectual inquiry going on at SLN and continues to this day. But there was a carryover effect. And the whole Bay Area in the 50s and early 60s was a kind of East meet, the center of 
east meeting west. And so you had people like Abraham. Oh, there's Esalen. Okay. But you had people like Abraham Maslow teaching there and coming to, to um, have conversation with all these other great thinkers. And out of that, from Maslow and other early psychologists, cutting edge psychologists, became a revolution in psychology, which at that time was dominated by behaviorists and Freudians. And so what became humanistic psychology and what became transpersonal psychology and the introduction of spirituality into legitimate psychological inquiry uh, and the assessment of what, it, what is possible for human beings to become. The human potential movement came out of that East meeting West uh, cauldron. The New Age movement and the self-help phenomenon in the 70s, all that came out of that. Anybody who's taken a, 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 who took a self-help workshop any time since the 70s was influenced by yogic teachings even if they never heard uh, uh, any th language because all those self-help teachers had gurus and they studied at places like Esalen and they were influenced by Alan Watts and all these other people. So all this came out of that and a large, lot of it centered in the Bay Area and this was one of the central uh, uh, pivot point places, the uh, American Academy of Asian Studies and some of the people there, you see Spiegelberg, who I think is second from the left, I can't see from here. And the woman in the middle is Judith Tyborg, who was a direct de a disciple of Sri Aurobindo, an Orange County girl who went to India in the 50s. And next to her is uh, Haridas Chaudhary, who was sent here by uh, Aurobindo to work with these people and also started something called the Cultural Integration Fellowship, which still exists in San Francisco as a East meets West place. I've spoken there a couple of times. People, every Sunday morning, it, you know, it, they have seminars and workshops. And the, um, and the person on the right, your right, is young Alan Watts. How many remember Alan Watts and his work? Okay. You can still go online and hear Alan Watts. He was the sort of leading uh, translator and promulgator of all the Eastern spiritual teachings and a great character and a great speaker and a clever man and a rogue of the highest order. And um, at a, that, a, that academy, shut down at a certain point, but it became the California Institute of Integral Studies, which is still in San Francisco and doing very well and has a large uh, program in East-West psychology and yoga studies and all kinds of other things. So this is the kind of thing that happened as, as the teachings get integrated and spread. Among the people who would come to hear Watts and Chaudhary and the others and learn Eastern philosophy were the beat poets of San Francisco. So you see Allen Ginsberg in there. I don't think Gary Snyder's in there, but he was one of them. And so beat poetry and the beat sensibility has a mostly Buddhist flavor, but you, you, could, you start to see that. And of course the <clears throat> The most famous of the, of the beat poets was Allen Ginsberg, who uh, is mostly known, you know, as, well, not just as a great poet, but as a, a provocateur and um, as a Buddhist. But he was also a bhakta and had gone to India uh, and, and learned the Vedic chanting and bhakta, bhakti yoga. And <clears throat> in the 60s, uh, was drawn and you, to the, uh, Har, the early Hare Krishna movement and their guru, and you would see him in public places chanting with the Hare Krishna people. And you, you could go online and see footage of him like at the Democratic National Convention in 1968, chanting with people by, by Lake Michigan, trying to calm the vibe. <laughs> 
and you know, chanting Om at anti-war rallies and, and all this sort of thing. And, and I'm now going to give, play the entertainment highlight of, the, of my presentation, which is um, a moment in 1968 when William F. Buckley uh, invited Alan onto his uh, talk show. And so you had this meeting of the arch-conservative uh, spokesperson, William Buckley, and the hippie beat poet. And I, I'm convinced this is the first time um, most Americans heard Kirtan. And helpfulness and cooperation. And I think the cause of their paranoia, because their paranoia, is our paranoia. It's a mirror-reflecting system. The two images are just reflecting each other, paranoia building up, like in a barroom brawl. The more we think in terms... If you keep this up, I'm going to ask you to read more poetry. Oh. <laughs> Why don't I see me instead? No, it's just that in politics you are a little bit naive. Uh, well, that's a, that's a language naive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I come I, from an old tradition. Right. So. Do you know the Hare Krishna chant? No, go ahead. Yeah. The preservation of the universe instead of its destruction. Krishna returns in the Bhagavad Gita every time there's a flood, fire, original sin leading to atom bombs. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Which brings us to the 60s. So I, some of you are probably in that picture in the lower right. <laughs> so the 60s, um, if you're young or you were some other country at that time um, and you weren't here and don't remember it or if you don't remember it for other reasons, um, <laughs> Whatever you've heard about the 60s is true. <laughs> but it was also a time of sincere and, and almost desperate spiritual seeking on the part of many, many people. All of the experimentation, every, all, all the excess was a, 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 a byproduct of a search for truth and a search for what is it all about and who are we and what are we doing here and how do you live a fulfilled life and it was it was profound and it was deep and the teachings from India became an, a central um, gathering point for this search it became obvious that the East had something to offer and we knew about it because of many of the people that I've already mentioned. Alan Watts and Huxley and all those people. There were some gurus that started to come, but they hadn't gotten around very much. <clears throat> we were reading the autobiography of a yogi, along with the others. Roy said that... Um, the copy he got cost four dollars. The copy I still have, which I read in 1969 or 70, hardcover, is five dollars. I didn't have five dollars. I, I don't. I don't remember buying it. <laughs> I remember reading it, and I suspect 
the, the book has sold four or five million, but that doesn't count how many people passed them along, especially back then. It was just being passed around from one you know, crash pad to another. I probably just never returned it to whoever I... <laughs> And so I like to think I'm working off that karma by, <laughs> by talking about it now. And so all these influences started turning people to the East, and among the, uh, those influences was music. So we had this seminal moment, what I think of as a seminal moment, in 1965. Where is it? So why did I play that? It was the first time most people heard a sitar. And at first, it was, you know, most people, it was a musical phenomenon. And then they used it again. George used, Harrison would use it again. And then other rock and roll groups used it again. And, and it became a kind of sound of the 60s. But it wasn't just a music. It wasn't just an inst a musical instrument because there was something about the sound of the sitar and where it came from and the sp spiritual and philosophical underpinnings of Indian music that drew people. And it was around then, because of his association with uh, George, that Ravi Shankar became a, su a superstar. Now, the history of this is great. And I, we don't have time, but you know, Ravi Shankar had been here for almost 10 years, coming to the West by the time he met George. He had become known among classical aficionados because the great violinist Yehudi Menuhin introduced him to the West and recorded a Grammy-winning album with him. And he, be, he was known among uh, certain uh, jazz people because he recorded with jazz musicians. And John Coltrane and his wife Alice became interested in, in Eastern spiritual teachings because of their attraction to the music and named their son Ravi. And Alice went on to become a Swami. And there, so there's all these influences going on. But it's when he, the Beatles being the Beatles, it's when uh, George started studying with Ravi Shankar that his life really changes. And Ravi Shankar becomes a spiritual, a, a musical superstar and promulgates the spiritual teachings underlying the music to the hippies who would come to hear him play in concert. And this was, a, this was deeply profound. So the next step on, the, on George's journey, George goes and, and studies with Ravi Shankar and comes back deeply immersed in the spiritual path. Ravi Shankar gave him one of Vivekananda's books, Raja Yoga, to read, and the autobiography of a yogi. And for years, George would carry copies of the autobiography to give out to people. And he stayed associated with that lineage to a certain degree. And then this, I consider the first rock and roll Upanishad. You, you, within you, without you. Because, you know, I can't read the lyrics now. I'll let you just take a moment and read the, the last lines of that song. This is, this is a Mahavakya. This is, right, this is a great utterance coming from a rock and roll uh, singer um, talking about the reality within you, without you. All of which leads to this seminal moment when the Beatles meet the person who would ever after become known as the Beatles guru. <laughs> and to this day, long after his passing, is still referred to as the Beatles guru. And this was a, a seminal moment. When they met him in 1967 uh, and learned his uh, transcendental meditation, Beatles were so famous and so revered by young people that I, some of you may remember, whatever they did, millions of people had to do. 
And now they were doing something called meditation. So the floodgates opened. Everybody had to meditate. Overnight, we not only knew there was something called meditation, but we knew there was something called the mantras, as people called gurus, and soon we would know there was a place called an ashram, because within months they would go off to India on what I call in, in American Veda the most important spiritual retreat since Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. Because the publicity, the media attention on this was extraordinary. And, but you have to think about it. This is 1967 and 8. So you had cover stories like this in Look Magazine and Life Magazine. Every magazine in the world had a feature article about the Beatles and meditation or the Beatles going to India. And of course, Mia Farrow also went to the, at the same time. So it was in all the Hollywood press. It was extraordinary. And, um, and the media attention was like, what is this? What's going on here? Oh, it's another youth phenomenon. But wait a minute. Why would four guys who are richer than anybody in the world and could do anything they wanted and are young, when they, they want to go on vacation and they're going to sit in, with their eyes closed in a, in a funky place called an ashram on the Ganges? Why? What's going on? So there was that flavor of them looking for the reality of existence, and it was more important than all the other stuff. And the coverage of meditation was largely about why all these young people were drawn to it. And it wasn't just because their heroes, the Beatles, were doing it. They kept meditating, and their lives changed. And their parents turned out to be very happy. They were. They didn't know what was going on, but it was better than having them go to rehab. <laughs> or, or, yeah, and, and a lot of the news coverage was like that. It was like, well, I wish they'd go to church, but at least they'd gone back to school. And at least they can talk to me again. And at least they now, I'd rather have them meditate, whatever the hell that is, than uh, take drugs. And that's... That's what it was. It was like, and you see it in that cover story. You, you, the headline uh, reads, uh, it's about life on campus and kids getting off of drugs to meditate. That caught the attention of a lot of grown-ups, not just parents, but psychologists and physicians who said, what's going on here? Maybe India has something to offer us. And that's when the first studies of the effects of meditation were done. The first one published was in 1970. It's done by, a, as a graduate uh, PhD uh, project by a young physio uh, physiologist at UCLA. It got published in major journals. Herbert Benson at Harvard Medical School picked up on it and he joined forces with the Keith Wallace and they did another study, and that ended up in Scientific American. And then the floodgates opened. So within a few years, meditation had gone from the hippie culture and the youth culture to the mainstream because there was now scientific evidence that something happens physiologically, and it lowers blood pressure and all this other stuff that evolved now to where there's studies going on all over the place, hundreds of studies on different forms of meditation different aspects of yogic practice. And so within a few years, it goes from, the cover stories go from young people getting off of LSD to meditate to their parents getting off of Valium <laughs> and using it for stress reduction and anxiety and depression and all that. And it is now mainstream. And it becomes medicalized and psychologize. And that's part of this adaptation that happens. There's the downside to this, the spiritual content kind of button. And now it's stress reduction. Just like yoga is now physical fitness or something. So we have, this is part of why people like us have to be very vigilant 
that these teachings in all their diversity and all their great versatility of use don't get reduced and trivialized at the same time. Yogananda, by the way, was one of those very skillful people in adapting these teachings. All the great gurus were. They knew not to tamper with the essence of these teachings and their, their true value and to protect the integrity of the teaching, but at the same time to adapt it to a, a new culture and a new era. If you go to CSE on Sunday morning, it will resemble a church service. If you go to any SRF place in the country for the last 40, 50 years or more, well, as Roy was saying, that Yogananda would give sermons. Now, it wouldn't be like a regular church service, but they don't do that in India. There's no Sunday services in Hindu temples in India. This was part of the adaptation process. Yogananda used mail order to get his teachings out. That was a newfangled technology that they didn't have in India at that time. This was, so these teachings get adapted, and all the teachers were skilled at it. Now, I, we, we're running low on time, but now we have this tidal wave of interest in meditation and yoga, and one of the results of the, the Beatles the, uh, phenomenon was all the other gurus and teachers and lineages that had started to have a presence and would now come had a, a much more receptive uh, clientele, you could say, or following. And so people started finding their way to the guru of their choice, the lineage of their choice, the practice of their cho choice. And gradually, the, the, the great diversity of yogic teachings start to uh, get... Uh, um, settled in America in their different enclaves. So you had people like Swami Vishnu Devananda, who had been here for about 10 years, just teaching some people here and there and starting to train yoga teachers. And now suddenly he was getting many more people coming to him. And, um, and Swami Satchidananda, who had come in the, in the late 60s, suddenly was the most popular guru in New York by 1969 and ended up being helicoptered up to start the Woodstock uh, Festival. And here he is speaking to you know, 400,000 people who couldn't wait for the rock and roll to begin. <laughs> and, but he was, and, you know, and he was giving them this Vedic teaching and closed with some chanting of, of mantras. And his organization flourished and is still going strong. And uh, the Hare Krishnas, of course, were popular, uh, seen as a very small cult who annoyed people at airports back then. <laughs> but but now, now look what's happened. They were the first people who were doing kirtan. Now you have kirtan here. Now you have bhakti fest with 3,000 people showing up for four days of, of kirtan. You have Krishna Das performing at the Grammy ceremonies. I mean, this is all these years later. <clears throat> and people doing serious scholarly work about the Vaishnavite tradition that they represented. That seemed so weird back in the day. And you had people like Krishnamurti, who had been in America for decades at that time, suddenly becoming way more popular than he ever was, denouncing gurus, <laughs> and claiming not to be one, and yet being treated as one because everybody wanted a taste of India and its teachings, and there was this brilliant Krishnamurti. Swami Rama, who was studied uh, at the Menninger Clinic, now became even more popular and, and started his Himalayan Institute. Uh, Muktananda, of course, came in the uh, early 70s and established the city yoga tradition here and uh, introduced the West to Kashmir Shaivism. And of course, his successor, Guru Mai, essentially, she, her role is uh, understated in a lot of the story, but it's very important because, as you may have noticed, all the, great, the gurus we're talking about were men. 
mostly older men compared to their followers. Now you had a young woman. This was a very important, uh, and she drew, uh, she got attracted a lot of women who finally had a role model as a realized spiritual being. And there were others like Guru Maharaji, who when he came was called the 13-year-old perfect master and had a big following and was uh, considered a cult and then gave it up when he met an older flight attendant <laughs> from California and got married. And his family denounced him and moved back to India. Well, it turns out he never stopped teaching. He just gave up that guru thing, and became a householder and raised his family and, and in Malibu and went back to his original name, Prem Rawat, and all these years to this day has been teaching around the world in a business suit in a very respectable manner. And if, whoops, Rajneesh had his teachings and everything you've heard about Rajneesh is true, but, <laughs> but he also wrote brilliant books and brought out aspects of, of the tantric tradition that uh, was very valuable. And of course, we had the, uh, the, the, the most important Hatha Yoga innovators, uh, Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, coming uh, for the first time in the mid or late 70s and starting the more systematic teaching of Hatha Yoga, especially uh, and of asana and training people by the dozens. And now every yoga studio in the country owes a debt to these guys. And then a new phenomenon begins. Well, it actually begins around 1969, 70, when now you start to have Americans taking ownership of these teachings and becoming well-known teachers in their own right. So Ram Das always was the most famous of the lot and typified it. We have another example of that here in our, in our prose. I mean, you're all here because of an American who became a lineage holder and is teaching. Then later, after the wave of interest in gurus in the 60s, many more did in their own small way. People became TM teachers, people became yoga teachers, people became swamis with Muktananda or Satchitananda or whomever. And this started to, to, to spread and, and they became the, the uh, means of transmission. And I always hold, think of Ramdas as the kind of uh, paragon of that. And it was very important because he was famous. He came back as Baba Ramdas. He had a guru. He was the L L LSD guy is now teaching spirituality in, in an authentic way. He had a Harvard pedigree. He could have been a guru. He chose to be Ramdas. And he attracted a lot of people who could relate to him as just a sort of elder and a spiritual teacher who did not have to be bowed to in the way gurus were in those days and became a very important figure. Some people did become gurus. That's just Ramdas teaching and be here now. And some people became promulgators of these teachings through scholarship and science. So Dean Ornish, as many people know, you know, he's world famous for his research in heart disease and preventive medicine. He developed his protocol as a disciple of Swami Satchidananda. He never talked about that because and do that, but now he can because yoga is now more mainstream. And, uh, and of course, as I said, some people became gurus. These are the, the ones who developed, started being gurus, be, were treated as gurus, developed lineages of their own. And then another important phenomenon, and we don't have time to go into it, but Western religious leaders, and here I have three Catholic exemplars, Thomas Merton, B. Griffiths, and Thomas Keating, who are still alive, were outspoken about their debt to Eastern spiritual teachings and how it deepened 
and inform their own religion and their own uh, religious uh, mission in the world. And in Thomas Keating's case, he drew from the popularity of meditation forms in the early 70s to create centering prayer, which is now practiced by hundreds of thousands of Christians. So we now have the sort of Christianization and what, what would be the Jewish equivalent, Judaization. So now you have Jewish meditation and Christian meditation, and Jewish yoga and Christian yoga. You even have the Kirtan rabbi. Google it. <laughs> He's doing Kirtan in the same traditional way we did last night, but he uses Hebrew. Fascinating stuff. So this becomes part of a revolution in Western religion now, where it becomes the, the, the essence of Eastern teaching starts to inform Western religion, and we have a rediscovery of Jewish and Christian mysticism and a rise in popularity of Sufism because people want these practices and want these essential teachings. And of course, new gurus come, and they still come. These are the two most popular now. Amma, the so-called hugging saint, and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, although I prefer this picture of him. <laughs> he was kind enough to do product placement for me. <laughs> it's, this is not photoshopped either. And, and, uh, and of course, the, the Hatha Yoga boom, the latest iteration of, of these of the transmission and the kirtan boom. We now, as I said before, have kirtan superstars who 30 years ago were lucky if five people showed up in someone's living room to chant with them. And now we have this, and now we have even hip hop transmission, ladies and gentlemen. How many know MC Yogi? Okay, see, go Google MC Yogi. This is, this is great stuff. This is what I call hip-hop piranhas. He is telling the story of Hanuman and Shiva and all this in hip-hop. And you haven't lived until you have, like I did, play this at a Hindu temple. It's, it's great. And um, we'll leave it at that, and we'll leave this up here as a subliminal hint that uh, we'll be selling books. Um, thank you all. Namaste. Namaste.